The Minister of Transportation, Rotimi Amechi, escaped being kidnapped by hoodlums at the Rigasa train station yesterday. Bashir Gaba blames Libya and thinks the security chiefs are doing a great work. And like Imo, like Bielsa, the governor of Imo state, Hope Uza Dimas, asked the Supreme Court to strike out an application seeking to review his judgment on Imo governorship election that declared him the winner of March 9 election. So why is the APC asking for fresh elections in Bielsa? This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. The Minister of Transportation, Rotimi Amechi, and other passengers escaped being kidnapped by hoodlums at the Rigasa train station on Sunday evening. A co-convener of Bring Back Our Girls group, Aisha Yosufu, confirmed this via Twitter. She also said that her brother and sister-in-law were on the train when the incident occurred. So if a minister of the Federal Republic is not immune to the kidnapping in the country, who is then? I'm being joined this evening on the show to discuss more about this by uh, the co-convener herself, Aisha Yusufu, Bring Back Our Girls. Thank you for joining us this evening on the show. Thank you for having me. And also joining us this evening is social commentator Mokhtar Mohammed. Thank you, Mokhtar, for being on the show this evening. Thank you. So we're going to go straight into it. Let's talk about this. Um, the ministers come to actually uh, rebut your statement that nothing of sort happened. Take us through what really the situation was. Uh, okay, so I'm in Lagos for a, a program, okay. and then uh, yesterday at night I got texts from my sister, a message saying that, oh my goodness, they almost were victims. Um, so she sent me the message. So I called her and I asked what happened. So on that train, I had my sister, my brother, and my, my sister in law were there. So they went with the, uh, the last train, and of course, in the last few weeks, we have had a, a, a series of attacks on the road. Yes. So when you get to the Rigasta station, there are two ways to leave that place. You either go through Rigasta or you go through Mando together. And that Mando road in the last few weeks has repeatedly been on, uh, under attack. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, my sister went off in her own vehicle, then my brother and his wife, uh, they decided to first of all follow that route. And they were quite happy, say, the fact that the minister was there yeah. and then with the security and they were blowing siren and everything and so when they went, went off the entire direction they also quickly were following to go through and be able to use that cover of the siren and then the next thing of course the ministers this thing the gunshots were heard according to them and they were like oh some puto some puto meaning oh they are out they are out and then that convoy came on and they came back and they scattered they fled you okay, know the criminals me, were saying some puto no the, the people the around people were yeah we okay. mentioned the some puto meaning the criminals have uh, come out, the bandits are out. And so the cars were, uh, you know, they were fleeing. You know, there's this, uh, what do you call it, this road, uh, this divide, the road of separator that you have. Okay. Some of these cars, according to my brother, were climbing it and just going away. And they all had to leave. And uh, it's, it's, for me, I find it quite, it's, it's, it's not surprising that there is denial because that is what has consistently gone. You know, the thing that pains me the most, by the time I called my, uh, my sister-in-law that yesterday night around 10, when after I'd left a, a, a cocktail when I called her, she was so she was like, Oh, okay, now that we have a minister and he has actually witnessed what citizens go through. Something will be done about it. For you to wake up this morning and see a minister lying about the issue, nobody is saying that your, your car was shot, uh, was shot at because it, because if it was, you wouldn't be able to deny it. But there was an attack. Why are they denying this? This was the same thing they did with Abuja Kaduna Road, where we kept saying there are attacks on Doha Road. Citizens were crying out. They kept denying it. The same thing with insurgency uh, in the Northeast. And today, here we are being at the mercy of these bandits, these terrorists, who every time they, our government denies this an attack, empowers them and makes our lives not to be of any value. And it needs to stop. The government needs to understand that the, this war against uh, insecurity, against insurgency, is not going to be won by lies and propaganda. All right, Mukta, I'm just going to take your reaction to this. I mean, what was your reaction when you heard this news and the, the Honorable Minister's response to this? I was not surprised. Um, like she said, it has always been denial, shifting of blame, is today is the community leaders that are not working. The next day is the governors. The next day is this government has been living in deniers. And I, I, I have a lot of respect for a person like Rotimi Amechi, being one um, minister that travel with train because he's the minister of transportation. And so those should have been an eye opening for him to begin to look at ways to make trade transportation. Um, very um, security um, good for, for, for the citizen. Knowing fully well that this administration has blamed themselves that they want to bring Ray 
um, 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 rail transportation into streamline. They want to be begin to move goods from point from point A to point B. They want to begin to move even with citizens to make the roads convenient, to make easy movement of, of goods and services and also individuals. So it's, it should have been like a lesson to him to go back to the president and say, look, this thing is real. I was almost kidnapped. And I think it's high time we begin to take this security, especially with has to do with him being from that sector and it's happening right in front of him. I think um, it's very disappointing, but it's not surprising. Like I said, we've always lived in denial. When it comes to security, it's always been one propaganda or the other, even with our lives. Yeah. Now, the other minister did describe the news as fake news and asked people to ignore it. Then in your response on Twitter, you did refer to him as a liar, saying there were eyewitnesses. Well, I didn't specifically call him a liar. Okay. I say, well, he, he should be ashamed of himself. Because this is something, why do you play, why do you do propaganda with people's lives? You understand? He is, I, I, I'm looking for the, I'm trying to be actually polite and nice, but the, the words are coming out of my head. Because when you come out, immediately he came out and said, oh, it's fake news. Yes. And I've said this thing before, and I'm going to repeat it here again, that the biggest producer of fake news in Nigeria is the federal government of Nigeria. They come out and they call news fake news. The same way they said the attack in the Northeast was fake news. But today, what do we have? People are being killed over there. And right now, they can't deny it. So where do we get to a stage where they feel that their image is more important than the lives of the people? What about the people that, 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 that today, like for example, my, one of my sisters that was there, I told my sister, my brother, my sister, hello. this morning she told me she woke up, she had nightmares all through the night. People are being psychologically damaged. And here we have the government officials denying something that has happened. Where is this going to take us to? We know there's an issue. The first of all, what you need to do in solving a problem is it's acceptance that there's a problem. When you keep lying that there's no problem, where does that take us to? Now, I want to read your tweet as I have it here. It said, um, you said, Chibuka wrote to me, Amechi, you should be ashamed of yourself. My sister and brother and my sister-in-law were on that train. When your convoy scattered and you fled like a newborn mouse, whom water had been poured on, it was witness. Governance is not by lies and propaganda. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What is the government not getting right when it comes to the issues of addressing banditry, kidnapping, as it obtained right now? Because recently, the Kaduna Project Expressway has been a no-go area. What is the government failing to do to address banditry and kidnapping on our road? Denial. They think it doesn't exist. They think it's, they, today they think it's opposition that is putting the banditry, the kidnappers, and the terrorists. They don't seem to come to terms with it that it has begin, it's now beginning to live with us. Every Nigerian lives in fear. I, it's unfortunate, it's a road that I applied all through my youth. It's one road then when I was calling in Federal University of Technology, Mina. We leave Mina as, as late as seven, eight, even nine, and we go through that road to Kaduna. So Rigasa is in the center of the town. Mando is even a little bit out of the town. And Mando is just right after Kaduna. Mando is even having the presence of the Nigerian Defense Academy yeah. Uh, headquarters there, and they also have the president of the Nigeria Air Force Base. And merely you are going to Mando, you see the security checkpoint everywhere. So why is it that it's easy for Bandit to even deal our security forces, even in places that we think they should be scared of? I think it's something the government really need to look at. Uh, because the government are beginning to tell us that it's like security is up to us individuals, citizens, to begin to provide security for themselves. And that is why you see different groups are coming out. Like they said, it's a time bomb. Something worse than terrorism is about to happen if the government doesn't do something about it. Now, a sitting governor did say sometimes last week that he thinks the federal government should go into negotiations with these bandits. I mean, Aisha, you want to respond to this? Do you think we've, have we gone into that yet to start negotiating with these bandits, these terrorists? You cannot negotiate from the point of defeat. Mm. You, if, you, if there's going to be any negotiation, we should do it from the point of where we know we are winning the war. Right now, we aren't doing anything. What's the, what, what are we negotiating for? First of all, like you said, we should stop the denial. We should understand that, yes, we have a problem at hand that we all need to deal with. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I kept, I kept tweeting about the fact that at Rigasa, kidnappers were coming in. They were taking people away. I was told I was lying. It's fake news. Mondo, the same thing. Rigachukun. A, week, a few weeks before, 
24 uh, ago, I talked about the fact that regard you could, people were not leaving their houses to go stay because I had people who had to come to my house to sleep at night and they would go to their houses in the morning. Now, I mean, they said it was all a lie until one of the people, one of the attacks that happened, one of those people, uh, the psychophants who call themselves generals on, on social media in support of the president, his mother and two sisters were kidnapped. And I took, I had to keep tweeting about the issue to, to, to the governor. So what, what we're talking about, uh, uh, negotiation, I don't understand. It's not a competition. The fact that they were Niger Delta militants, the fact that the Nigerian government went into negotiation with them, there was amnesty. It's not the same way that you now say we should begin to pay amnesty to terrorists. Because some have suggested that. There are two different things. What we need to do as a country is to first of all, our security chiefs, what are they doing? They aren't doing anything while they're still there. We need to reorganize our security apparatus. We need to begin to look for uh, intelligence gathering. What is DSS doing? What is DMI doing? Their business is not to arrest, uh, arrest people who are, who, who are demanding on the, from the president. Their business is to ensure they get information because today you cannot fight the war, the insurgency without uh, uh, intelligence gathering. Yeah. You saw what the president said, that he was going to use the same tactics they used to fight the civil war to fight the insurgency. I don't think it's living in the century that we are Doctor, you want to react quickly to the call for um, negotiations with these bandits? I mean, how, she has how, said it all. How, how, how do you negotiate? Is? Let's say Zamfara, they, I think when the government came, he said there were negotiations. Mm -hmm. Has it not failed? Kaksina, even the home state of the president, there was a time the, 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 the governor himself said that they were negotiating with the bandits. Has it not failed? Just yesterday, 30 people were killed in the village. So what are we talking, negotiating at this front of arts, like she said, at the point of weakness, like we are afraid of ban. This, they shouldn't compare the Niger Delta issue with what is happening in the Northeast or what is happening in the North. Let's remember that the Niger Delta issues, it was the elders of the Niger Delta that met with these guys. It was a recognized body, unknown yeah. body. No, they yeah. let, no, the leaders of the I remember then, the then vice president, good luck, Abele Jonathan, went to the creek to meet with these guys and came out and talked about, I look, I've spoken to them. They were elders like Edin Clark and others. They were talking to them, they knew them. They were no spirits. So what we are dealing with now, we are dealing with banditry. We don't even know them. We don't know who their leader, only the security force knows who their leaders are. So it's, it's, it's a different ball game all entirely. Now, Let me just say yes. something. I just want to add something, you know, like the attack you talk about that happened in Katsina. What, 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 what is being reported about the president? He said that uh, the, it's because of the revenge, it's revenge killing that the bandits, their people were killed. How yes. would the president say that about his people? His people are being killed, and you're talking about the fact that it's revenge killing. So we are either, if, first of all, they will deny. Where they don't deny, they blame we, the victims, for being attacked, for the failure of governance. And we must understand something, that the primary responsibility of government is the protection of lives and properties. And any government that cannot protect lives and properties of its citizens is not fit to be called a government. And now the issue of regionalism, of um, different security outfits coming up in the regions, and Many people have expressed concerns about the originalism of these outfits being created that eventually were, were sliding into anarchy and that the, the, exi the existing federation as it stands as Nigeria with the creation of this regional security outfit that we stand to express an anarchy. Do, do you agree with that, Mukhtar? I sincerely agree with you. I don't believe we are right for state police. I don't believe we are right for regional police. I don't believe because of the mentality of the average Nigerian politician. Then what's the alternative you, to all of this insecurity and banditry and kidnap is going there? There's an alternative. Get yeah. your security apparatus on guard. These guys are not spirit. These guys cannot be well trained than our military personnel. That's what I keep saying. How effective is our military? I mean, because at the end of the day, are they, the are military, they well equipped, The military has a well challenge. Equipped. The challenge yes. of the military, the president knows, but he's also living in denial. Look, the military assistants now are living, there's, there's a lot of rivalry within the military because when you have a service chief that is supposed to have, not that he's supposed to have left this, this post as a chief of army staff, he's supposed to have retired. And if he doesn't retire, there will not be promotion of the next people. So what we are seeing now is some people that are due for promotion cannot be promoted. So how do you, how do you think there will, there will be motivation to go out, to fight when I know I'm due and somebody is still there and his tenure is still being extended, even after spending the mandatory 30 years in service, he's still being extended because he's a chief of army staff. And the same chief of army staff can come on national daily and say, even if you remove me, it's not going to stop terrorism.
That shows that there's a problem. Now, Aisha, there's been, uh, there's been... Okay, you want to say something? To yes, that? I need to say Please. something about that because I differ in terms of when we're talking about the security apparatus of the nation. Yeah. I believe it is half time we have community policing, it's half time we have state policing, regional policing. It's okay. The thing is that if we say that we don't want... Uh, the, Nigeria is not ripe for security apparatus to be in the hands of politicians, is the president not a politician? He is a politician. And the whole security apparatus is under the federal government, yeah, I think under the, the direct... This, That's a they might be hijacked for, 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 it, for political reasons. Yeah. Is, is the press, is the, at, the office, at the federal level, are they not hijacking it? Haven't we seen pol, uh, election be, being militarized? So are you saying that it's better for the federal government only to hijack it, if that's what we're thinking? The thing is that we need to have this across board. What for me, it's, it's not acceptable, is for groups, like what we saw in the North, where certain group came out to do the uh, Shege Kafasa. That it's not acceptable. The governors can come together and form a we can have pol a, a, a community policy at different level. How do we spare a place whereby, for example, at Boko, uh, the fight against Boko Haram today, you can't do anything. Even if Shekau is here that you can kidnap you, you have to call Abuja to get instructions from Abuja to be able to do something. How does that work? When you're talking about community policy, the people on ground, look, we already even have policy committee. What do you, the vigilantes that we have? Today we have, there are places that the police will not go. They will not dare to bear the vigilantes will do that because it's their own place. It's their own on home. If you're talking about crime, crim criminality, People on ground, it's all about in intelligence, that intelligence gathering. People on ground know who is who, who is doing what. They are able to trace these criminals, like you say. So they will be able to work more. If I'm in my community, I know I'm going to protect my people. I will work hard. So on the issue of saying that, oh, because uh, politicians will not be, the president is a politician. Right now, our security uh, apparatus is under one politician. And so let's have different politicians. Right. Have let's take a look at the call, the clamor for the sacking of the service chiefs. How much of a solution would that be for our security issue right now as a stand? Aisha, uh, you, want, you want to go for Yes, yeah. every solution. First of all, when somebody, it's not, look, for me, if I tell you, it's not, it's not even just about the service chief. If we really, really want to be honest with ourselves, we need to sack the commander in chief. That's where the problem is. Since we can't sack the commander in chief, it's to call on him to not sack the service chief in the sense that when people are failing, they say insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. They haven't brought anything new. They are not engaging this. Let me the give you an example. The commander in chief being the president the of the president, that's the president. Well, there was a call on the floor of the Senate by um, Yenaya Abaribe asking for the resignation it's of an the opposition. president. Yes. That would tell is an opposition because he didn't get to be there. That's why he's saying the president should be sacked. So, um, for me, I keep saying it. I think, like she, she said, I think the service chief has run out of idea. They need to go. The president is just being, just being stubborn, not listening to the people. Because I believe, sincerely speaking, I think the service chief has overstayed their bound. Look, when you look at these current service chiefs, these are the people that have been with this insurgency, either as, as commanders, mm -hmm. as these. The current chief of, um, chief of army staff was the one that was in charge of the West African procurement, um, procurement in terms of this insurgency. Yes. Remember that when he came, there was, a, there was a room that said that he has two houses in Dubai. And we, the president, everybody came with deaf ear on that. Say he has a right to have that because, but you need to look at it. Let's even look at that. The, the current chief of army staff has overstayed his bound. I think it's time for him to go. It's time for us to change strategy when it comes to fighting insurgency. The blame game should stop. We should face it on head and say, look, what can we do? Look, the insurgency that is happening. You know, let me tell you something. I have brothers that are in the military. They are right there in the northeast. Now, what happened there is the Nigerian army attempt to maintain their own side and let the terrorists maintain their own side. Nobody's going out to intrude into another person. That's why the governor of Bruno State was saying, it is high time we take the fight to them. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's just saying, okay, the air belongs to Boko Haram, don't go there, they shut down the... I don't, it's, the strategy we are being used is so... In, 24, in, 21, in, in this 21st century, we are still closing down um, uh, uh, a town for people not to come out at a particular time. You know, know talk, let, me, let, me, let me take you something you said. You did mention about changing of strategy. Uh, is there so much the changing of the second of the service chief? Because we need to provide an alternative to the second of the service chiefs. So what are they? You did mention the changing strategy. Maybe that is what we should begin to look at, not necessarily the people in there. The current service chief, are they ready to change strategy? Exactly. If they are ready to change strategy, they won't be doing it. Remember, they started with, now they, they, they came out with the, with, with, with the calm, 
that they say they I've forgotten the name they call that camp they open up the area they say they have one huge camp the old military will be here they will be here for a, for a, for a period of time when these guys are attacking the next villagers before the military will respond you, is it not a, is it time that you see you I was so upset that I heard that the Nigerian police say they went to a place they went to a community they fought and they killed about 250 bandits up to date we don't need, so you know where the boundaries are you know their community. You know that they are in a certain location. So there's a problem. Once insecurity continued so long, somebody have said it before. It was even a then um, um, late president, uh, late Sanya Abacha. Sanya said, when there is security for so long, then there, there, there's, there's conspiracy within the government. Because even the current governor of Kanasi, Eru Fai said it a time ago. Mm -hmm. He said there is no presidency that he, even when he was a minister, the type of security report he received, compared to what the president received. So the president needs to do something about it. The president needs to act decisively. And unfortunately, he came to power. Everybody expect him to crush Boko Haram, especially those in the south, mm. in the northeast. Because they felt he was an ex-general, he would bring sanity to the military, and we're going to, but unfortunately, I keep saying unfortunately, we are not making any progress. Rather, I think we are going back back and back by the day. Oh, let's consider the statement by the senior special assistant to the president of media and publicity, that's Gerba Shehu. He says the military is doing a good job and deserves to support of Nigerians. Do you agree with, with his statement there, Aisha? Absolutely not. I don't agree with that statement. I mean, what's there to agree with? People are being killed every day. Or is it that the lives of Ni Nigerian, Nigerians don't mean anything to them? Do you think our leaders have become desensitized to these killings? They don't care about the killings. For us, we are not human beings to them. All they care about is thumbprint, and every four years they get it. Now they've gotten it, and they have three more years to go out about that. They don't care. If not, how would you say that they're doing all they can? When people, citizens are being killed, soldiers are complaining, they're writing letters to the president to tell them that they're not being taken care of. Their welfare is not being taken care of. Look, when you talk about strategy, for example, he made, did mention something about Buratai, General Buratai, yes, having yes. houses in Dubai. The military came out to defend him to say that he has a farm snake and for, it is from the proceedings of the farm snake and also his savings that he bought houses in Dubai worth over $2 million. And I tell you, a general who has a farm that he's making that kind of money is not thinking of how to win the war against Boko Haram. Uh, I think it was uh, it's, it, Libya, Iraq that did uh, uh, what do you call it? an audit of their of their military, and they found fifty thousand ghost soldiers. Have we even done something like that? Did we try to check to shake and and uh, reform the, our military apparatus? If we do that today, how many mili ghost soldiers are we going to find in the Nigerian uh, military payroll? And you know one where ghost workers steal money from the people, from the economy, ghost soldiers take away money, steal money, and also cost people their lives. Because where there's supposed to be a 1,000 soldiers and you have 500 there and they say it's a 1,000, you know what will happen? People are going to be killed. So we haven't done anything. Even when it comes to intelligence guidance, what have they done? How come up to now we have not been able to infiltrate the camp of Boko Haram? Even if you should say, get some equipment, do, do them as decoy, put some, what do you call these transmitters or whatever, GPS that will give us location, let them take it away, go after them, know where they are. None of these things have been done. All we keep hearing is propaganda upon propaganda. The other time, the, uh, the, the military were saying that they were going to do, they are now going to fight this war in a spiritual way, spiritual warfare. And they brought in pastors and malams and everything, and they were praying. And you say they are winning the war? How? All right, he also did say something which, which sounds a little bit like an allegation. He, says, he said the reversals in the success recorded against Boko Haram were being undermined by the Libyan crisis, which led to the proliferation of small arms. Your quick reaction to this? We have seen, we, we've seen this excuse before. The, the, even the then president, good luck, Billy Janetta, said the same thing. So it's the same thing all over. And I remember then, they as opposition disagree with him. Mm -hmm. So why is it now it's your turn so it's okay? What do you mean by proliferation of arm? Were we not aware? Where is this arm coming from? Are they being produced here? If they're coming from Libya, don't you have um, 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 security, like she was saying, intelligent gathering? Why is it it's coming from Libya and he has to find himself to he has to find itself to in Nigeria? Why are we not taking care of our own area? If you see problem have known is half solved. If you know it's coming from Libya, what have you been able to do? Have you gone to meet even the to see how you can make look, look let me give you something. The Americans, when they want to go to a place, and to fight war, they first of all go into that very place that they think is, is, is like 
the, the, the manufacturing base of that thing and begin to infiltrate them and begin to, they, they are always split a group in Libya that will seem to know how these arms leave Libya. Yes. So what are we doing about it as a continent? Because now it's not making it feel like it's a continental problem. It's not just in Nigeria, but what we ask that question. These arms that are finding their ways to Nigeria, why are they not finding their way to Ghana? Mm -hmm. Why are they not finding their way to Guinea? Why is it it's only Nigeria? Is it that we are closer than them, we need to we need we need to be serious. Okay. We need to stop giving excuses. I know they need to say something because they have to work. They have to earn their money. Initially, Khan is acting like an opposition party. Mm -hmm. The next time, uh, Reverend, Reverend Matthew Kuka is saying out of uh, just more main, 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 an opposition, we need to listen to these people and say, okay, what do you know that we don't know? Let us know. That is our government. Let me just add on you what you said about yeah. excuses. They say excuses are like shoes, and you always find the one that fits. So our government is very good at finding excuses that will fit the situation and get away from not doing the things that they need to do. But the thing is that, look, the citizens must understand their part. As citizens, governance is made up of two parts. There's the demand side and the supply side. Why those we elect supply, we, the citizens, must make demands. And it is time for every Nigerian citizen to begin to make that demand. I say something, because most of us, we pray. We say, God forbid, it will not happen to us. I always remind people that yesterday's victims were once survivors. Oh, yes. Today's victims were yesterday's survivors. And tomorrow's victims will be today's survivors. Today's survivors are you and I that are alive today. We will be the next victims if this continues. And the more these attacks continue, the more the likelihood of every one of us becoming victim. And I also always want us to understand that those who have been killed before will not be killed again. The next to be killed are those of us that are alive. Who is next? Aisha Yusufu, co-convener, bring back our girls group. Thank you very much for being part of the show and for your contribution. Thank you for and also Mukhtar Mohammed, social commentator. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you. We'll take a quick break now, and when we return, we'll be discussing Amos State and the Supreme Court judgment. Do stay with us.